So um, Ben sent me a, a pre-release DVD before I came here, and I watched it. One of the things that I started thinking a lot about was how the experience of Brian Wilson, um, his emotional experiences over time, permitted him to really create this music that then affected me and affected all those who enjoy the Beach Boys over time once they listen to it. So, you know, whether it was Good Vibrations or some other song, his emotional experience was Im imbued into the music and that was communicated then to our ears and that affected how we went about our daily lives. And so what I'm going to talk about a little bit is how we s are starting to think how the brain may permit those experiences, those emotional experiences, the, the kind of the psychological experience of emotion. And then I'll delve a little bit into Brian Wilson's um, psychopathology, his schizophrenia, and um, I'll s end with a little plug about our department. So, um, so this 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 piece of art is the one I kind of one of the ones I kind of think about when I think about time, because it's uh, fire engine number five. It uh, is supposed to represent you know a fire engine going through I believe it was New York and uh, the experience of that that truck passing through and how the perception of that changed over time. So, um, and so the brain, this is a, a staining of the, of the, one kind of staining of the hippocampus. Um, what you see is, what I see at least, is the intense interconnectedness of all of the brain cells. And, and it's really the connections between these brain cells that permit us to see, that permit us to form memories, that permit us to hear. Um, and this is another form of staining where you can see actually how different brain cells, so the green cells are connected to the green cells, the blue cells are connected to the blue cells. So these intense connections between each other um, permit us to do all the things that we do, in, including hear the music that, that the Beach Boys made and experience the emotions that may come with that music. And so there are some ideas about how um, these networks, so this was actually a theory that was put forth in the 50s by a neuroscientist by the name of Donald Hebb. And his most famous idea is actually in the top panel, which is called basically um, neurons that fire together, wire together, right? So that when two neurons arrive at the same place at the same time, when they're active at the same place at the same time, they will be more likely to be, when one is active, the other one will be more likely to be active. And that was basically the first idea about how memories are formed, right? So you get input at one level, and it creates a cascade after that. When that neuron is active again, the same cascade is potentiated, right? It's more easily activated after that. But one of the things that's, no, you can go back. So one of the things that's less talked about is how this may happen in the absence of those stimuli, right? So what is in B is how these networks, in the absence of, um, external stimulus stay activated. It's kind of the idea of how short-term memory is works, right? So someone tells you their phone number and then you know you repeat it over and over and over again in the absence of that external stimulus. And then somebody, you know, 10 seconds later, a minute later asks you for the phone number. So this is to me the basic idea of how not just how short-term memory works, but how emotions can be sustained over time, right? So a certain feeling from a beautiful sunset or um, a great meal, how those experiences, that positive emotion, that savoring, can be sustained via brain circuits over the course of minutes, day, you know, hours, and even days. And so this is actually, this is kind of a complicated slide, so you'll have to forgive me, but this is, this is a representation of how information, so music, can pass through what's called the thalamus, an area deep inside the brain to the auditory cortex that then is passed to the amygdala. Some of you may have heard about the brain structure called the amygdala. It's important for um, different kinds of emotion, fear, as well as approach or repetitive processing. And it reverberations within that circuit permit us, is thought to help permit us to experience emotion over time, even when the, um, that emotional signal may not even be there. So I'm gonna, so that's, how time unfolds in the, in the brain over the course of, let's say, seconds and minutes, maybe hours. But then there's a different kind of, emo uh, kind of time, right? And that's developmental time that exists over years. And this was captured really beautifully in the movie 
as Brian Wilson kind of descended into psychosis, right? So as, as things worsened, um, you saw that happening. And that's usually the result of how the brain is maturing at different times in someone's age. So what you can see here is um, at different ages, typically you see different kinds of disorders start to emerge, right? So anxiety disorders start to emerge typically on the order of 11 years of age, 12 years of age, and schizophrenia is more typically seen later on in 18 to 25 year range. And that's typically caused by changes in the development of the brain. And so what you can see here is from about five to about 20, changes in how the brain uh, develops over these ages. And, and most prominently, you see that um, the prefrontal cortex, or the part of the brain that's in the very front up here, is the one that develops last. And that is part of, the, and that's important for several things, including the regulation of emotion, um, a, you know, working memory, so the maintenance of things in memory. And so it's, this part of the brain is implicated in a whole host of mental illness, including psychosis, depression, things like that. And um, so this is my attempt, starting attempt actually, at how to integrate these, these dynamics that exist over seconds with these longer term dynamics that happen over years, right? And so really to kind of encapsulate what this slide is talking about is it's what we think is starting to happen is that it's changes between the interactions between the front part of the brain, the part of the brain that's important for reasoning and emotional regulation with more evolutionary old parts of the brain like the amygdala. And it's the ability of this front part of the brain to be able to sustain this activity engagement to be able to help to regulate the more what are called limbic or emotional areas of the brain. And that over time is, as those front areas start to develop, they can do it better, they can sustain their engagement longer, and we're able to regulate our emotions, regulate our behavior better as time goes on. Okay, and so as I kind of get towards the end here, one of the things that I think is really exciting is using um, technology to be able to capture how real people experience emotion in the real world and use that to be able to understand who's going to develop depression or psychosis or any sort of mental illness or who's going to be particularly resilient and have well-being over time. So um, using cell phone technologies, right, we can, we can actually capture people's, we can ask people how they're feeling, capture their emotional state as they go about the daily work, their daily lives, as well as their location, right? So someone who may experience positive emotion or negative emotion in one area versus another area. And what we can start to do is we can start to map out where people experience emotion, how long they experience that emotion for. And using that, I think that we can identify people, especially kids that are about to kind of descend into psychosis or suicidality, we can understand better who's at risk, for example, for um, com trying to um, commit suicide or descend into an uh, area of um, psychosis. For example, with bipolar disorder, one of, the, one of the predisposing factors to a manic episode in bipolar disorder is when sleep disturbances start to happen, right? And so people may have, you guys may have heard about these apps that allow you to kind of note the quality of sleep. So using these apps in, in kids who may be at risk for developing mania, we may be able to identify who is starting to cycle in certain ways that we could then intervene before a full manic episode happens. Similarly, if there are changes in someone's patterns of behavior um, that's at risk for psychosis and schizophrenia, we may be able to understand that given this technology and intervene before a full psychotic break occurs. So I think that the possibility of understanding the evolution or unfolding of time and behavior using these technologies is really, really powerful, both at the brain level, at also the experiential and psychological level for improving treatments and, um, and just basic science understanding. So I'll, before I end, I just wanna present another one of my favorite pieces of art that um, kind of encapsulates time, which this is the new Descending the Sta Staircase by Duchamp. Oh, and I will say, I'll just say one other thing about mental illness, which is that this is Brian Wilson with Eugene Landy, and, and that's that um, the, um, the importance of, of seeking uh, 
psychotherapy if somebody has a mental illness, but in particular seeking psychotherapies that are empirically validated. So one of the issues in the movie that's raised that is, um, is the work of, that Eugene Landy did with Brian Wilson. And, and I think to me a core issue is that the, the work that Dr. Landy was doing was not empirically validated. There was no scientific basis to support any of the things he was doing. He was basically just going off of his intuition and clearly, clearly creating a lot of harm actually in Brian Wilson's life. So um, I think it's easy to take away from some of these kinds of situations that we hear about that psychotherapy, for example, can be dangerous. But as so long as you go with, you seek out um, therapies that are evidence-based, and there are a host of them that um, there can be, uh, these therapies are effective, and they bring um, benefit to most people that, that experience them. So um, empirically supported th treatments is basically a fancy way of saying they're backed up by science, um, they work, and in many ways they're better than actually a lot of drug treatments because there's low dropout rates, there is lasting improvement in the individuals when they're no longer seeking the treatment, uh, and each individual learns new skills. This is a, a website that people can go to if they want to actually seek out um, different therapies that are empirically supportive for specific mental illness, be it um, depression or schizophrenia, um, insomnia. And lastly, what I want to say is that uh, there's some really great work being done at the university in the Department of Psychology seeking uh, to better understand treatments for OCD and hoarding behaviors. And please, uh, if you have any interest in um, being a participant, uh, you don't actually, ha we're looking for control subjects, so you don't actually have to be suffering from one of those uh, mental illnesses, but don't hesitate to reach out and, um, and help us understand the treatment of, of um, mental illness. Thanks for your attention.